is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it all. Stop, 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 stop. Stop. I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical, it's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. Welcome to it, my friends. It is Tuesday here on the program. Appreciate you dialing it in. It's the Steve Gruber Show. Hey, um, if you'd like to get involved, the hotline number is 888 999 888-999-66 on the program today. We're going to talk about a cancer decoy that could attract and capture malignant cells and destroy them. We're going to talk gun control with Dr. John Lott. We're going to talk about how to keep you healthy by avoiding sugar, the number one inflammatory item you can eat, plus so much more. And then a discussion with Chris Farrell from Judicial Watch about the influx of illegal alien miners. I'll also have a long discussion with Jason Hart of Watchdog.org, who has been in a Twitter war with me, I guess, denigrating me because I, I don't support candidates that are conservative enough. As a result of that, we'll take a look at the conservatism and liberalism of Ronald Reagan. My point being is there's a balance out there. And if you apply a litmus test to people too strictly, you'll end up with no candidates at all. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, the man who police say intentionally ran over a Lansing firefighter a few days ago was angry because the Lansing Fire Department's annual Fill the Boot fundraiser was slowing down traffic. Now, a matter of road rage. Firefighter Des Roadman died after being involved in a hit-and-run accident last week while collecting donations for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. He left behind a wife who was pregnant with her first child. He'd only been married about two months. He had a conversation with 22-year-old Grant Jacob Taylor, some sort of an exchange. Taylor then drove down the road, pulled a U-turn, came back and drove over Roadman, killing him. Grant Taylor has been charged with open murder in the connection with Roadman's death. Police have said that Taylor intentionally hit Roadman. Now the Lansing State Journal reporting that court testimony indicates Taylor upset at slow-moving traffic, honked his horn and threw an apple core at Roadman before coming back to run him over. A witness reporting that Taylor accelerated before hitting Roadman. Taylor also had a history of mental illness. A public funeral for Roadman will be held at 10 o'clock to noon tomorrow at the Jack Breslin Student Events Center at Michigan State University's campus. A fund set up for Roadman's family has already collected more than $126,000. Hopefully to send his child to college and other things. Road rage, mental illness. Again, it's the ACLU that tore down the, the the mental health system of this country beginning in the 1950s. I want to send them a thank you note. Uh, Michigan's first case of bubonic plague, the Black Death. For real, the Black Death. Um... It has been reported a Michigan resident was confirmed in a Marquette County resident after a visit to Colorado. The patient received appropriate treatment and is recovering, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Health officials now reporting there is no concern about human-to-human transmission in this case. The person who contracted the illness had recently returned from Colorado in an area where the plague has been reported. There has been an increase in cases of the plague reported in the western U.S. this year with 14 human cases and four deaths reported. Nationally, on average, there are only three cases reported annually. 
The plague is a life-threatening but rare illness transmitted by fleas. It is caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis, which occurs among rodents and their fleas in rural and semi-rural areas of the United States. Can you imagine, though? Well, he's got the plague. He's, he's what? Or she? The plague does not normally occur in Michigan. Health officials say this is the first report of the disease in a Michigan resident ever. People who are traveling and recreating outdoors in the western U.S., however, should be aware of the risk for exposure to plague, said Dr. Eden Wells, chief medical executive for the State Department of Health and Human Services. Use insect repellent on your clothing and skin and make sure that any pets that may be along are receiving regular flea treatments. Human-to-human -human transmission is rare and usually requires direct contact with someone with pneumonic plague, health officials say. Can you imagine, though? You come home with the uh, with the plague. At any rate, and, and while we're going down this, um, while we're going down this line of discussion, how about this one? Try this one on for size. A 47-year-old Plymouth woman bitten by a rattlesnake in the University of Michigan's botanical gardens, according to the Ann Arbor Township Fire Department. The woman who was taken to the University of Michigan Hospital in unstable condition by Huron Valley Ambulance. Join the spokesman Joyce Williams. We have no update on this at this point. Call came in around 2 o'clock yesterday. The woman didn't have her shoes on. The snake bit her above the ankle. The snake is believed to be an eastern Massasauga rattler, the same species that bit a young girl there last year. When the child was bitten last year, experts from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources told the Ann Arbor News that these kinds of bites are rare. They also said these snakes are some of the least venomous rattlesnakes in the country, which is true. Unless, of course, you're allergic to them. So, you know, from, from, from the plague to rattlesnake bites in Michigan, strange day, strange headlines. All right, well, Donald Trump uh, packed the house again uh, last night. Donald Trump packed the house again last night, filling up with thousands of supporters. It's, um, it's pretty incredible to watch, and in the latest polls, in the latest polls, he has now cracked 40%. In some places, he has cracked 40% now. He's above 32% in New Hampshire. Ben Carson has moved into second place. John Kasich holds strong at third. But Trump at 32, Carson at 11, and Kasich at 11. Well, it's pretty clear that Donald Trump has the support of more in the Granite State than anybody else. Meanwhile, there's been a sharp erosion for Hillary Clinton among women supporters. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about political candidates and the, the drive for the perfect candidate, which doesn't exist in my estimation, but I'm going to talk about that straight ahead here on the Steve Gerber Show. Genuine Michigan common sense on display every day. All right. Let's get down to it. 18 after the hour on the Steve Gerber Show. I'm confused these days by the foaming dissent of those on the political right when it comes to presidential candidates and their nearly impossible set of standards to measure if each one is conservative enough. Those on the right lament that this candidate is too liberal on this and that one's too soft on that. If you dare voice support for someone in the GOP field, you're heading into dangerous territory, I can tell you, especially for those who demand strict adherence to a conservative code that allows very little wiggle room. Unless you think Ted Cruz is the answer, which so far I remain very much unconvinced of this notion, you are yourself labeled as too far left. 
I know this has been happening to me as of late. I would expect those of you that are regular listeners have come to a different conclusion over time. But let's start with a couple of very important stipulations. First of all, and most importantly, my politics begin at home and always have. I'm an American and proud to say so. I cast my votes on elections based on my best guess on the best choice for the future of the nation. I believe in America and feel incredibly blessed for having been born here and the privilege to live here. I feel the same way for my children, one of which probably voted for Barack Obama at least once. She was able to vote freely in a nation where she has the opportunity to pursue her dreams, whatever they may be, and have deep, passionate political discussions about where the country is headed and needs to go, or say nothing at all. It's a wonderful thing we like to call liberty. Unfortunately, over the past few years, those on the right and left have continued to polarize the 80% that occupy what I'll call the political middle ground. I think we need a pragmatist that is willing to weigh matters on merit and debate such things openly. We've not enjoyed that kind of activity under the Obama administration, and instead of been kept in the dark over and over again, and too many times, the Republicans have been just as complicit in this deceitful behavior. And it's at about this point in the conversation that someone, claiming to be a conservative, evokes the name of the Savior himself, Ronald Reagan. I loved Ronald Reagan and really believe we could use such a man again today. First and foremost, he was a man who was a true believer. America really was the shining city on the hill for him, but I doubt he could get past the hard right Republicans today. I don't think Reagan could win a single primary. Why? Well, that's pretty simple. Because based on today's strict standards, Reagan was far too liberal for today's crew. Let me give you some examples. And the best place to start any conversation about politics and whether a candidate is conservative enough is guns. How would the National Rifle Association score Reagan by today's standards? Not very well, I'm guessing. In an op-ed piece published in the New York Times in 1991, Reagan openly endorsed the Brady gun control bill, writing in part, named for Jim Brady, this legislation would establish a national seven-day waiting period before a handgun purchaser could take delivery. It would allow local law enforcement officials to do background checks for criminal records or known histories of mental disturbances. Those with such records would be prohibited from buying the handguns. Reagan went even further by singling out those that would object to such measures by writing this. Critics claim that waiting period legislation in the states that have it doesn't work. The criminals just go to nearby states that lack such laws to buy their weapons. True enough, and all the more reason to have a federal law that fills the gaps. While the Brady Bill would not apply to states that already have waiting periods of at least seven days or that already require background checks, it would automatically cover the states that don't. The effect would be a uniform standard across the country. Even with the current gaps among states, those that have waiting periods report some success. California, which has a 15-day waiting period that I supported and signed into law while governor, stopped nearly 1,800 prohibited handgun sales in 1989. New Jersey has had to permit had a permit to purchase system for more than two decades. During that time, according to the state police, more than 10,000 convicted felons have been caught trying to buy handguns. And Reagan summed it up this way. The level of violence must be stopped. Sarah and Jim Brady are working hard to do that, and I say more power to them. If the passage of the Brady Bill were to result in a reduction of only 10 or 15 percent of those numbers, and it could be a great deal greater. It would be well worth making it the law of the land. I mean, let's be perfectly honest here. This op-ed piece alone should have had folks ripping Reagan's pictures off the wall of the John Birch Society get-togethers, but it gets worse. Reagan negotiated with terrorists. This is something everyone knows, but conservatives try to bury and pretend it never happened. There were at least eight shipments to Iran. Yes, that Iran, over 18 months. Some of the weapons were actually shipped through Israel. Israel shipped the weapons to Iran. This should also be enough for Tea Party activists to toss his picture in the garbage, but nobody focuses on those things and other shortcomings. Why? Simple. Ronald Reagan on balance was the greatest president of my lifetime, at least so far. Here's a short list of his great accomplishments. First, he wasn't Jimmy Carter. That's a pretty good first. Second, he created a roadmap to beat the Russians and destroy the Soviet Union on the principle that America is the greatest nation ever. Reagan inherited an economy destroyed by liberal policies and malaise, including stifling tax rates, 
20% mortgage rates, skyrocketing unemployment, and he turned it around, beginning with the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981. During the 80s, private domestic investment rose 77%. Economic growth averaged 4.6%. And the collections for the IRS went from $500 billion to a $1 trillion because Americans at all levels went to work and earned more than they ever had. He deregulated oil prices, turning loose an incredible wave of cheap energy that powered America for 25 years, and maybe most importantly, he created the IRA, the Individual Retirement Account, saving hundreds of billions of dollars for American workers. Reagan knew America was then and is now an exceptional nation that is unparalleled in world history. But sadly, by today's standards, Ronald Reagan would not get through the early primary season. You see his stand on guns and terror and other issues would have been the end of it. The moral of the story is this. There is no perfect candidate. And if you think there is, you're part of the paralyzing problem in the nation today. The first and most important thing is to find a candidate that can win the White House. I believe it'll be someone more like John Kasich than Ted Cruz. Oops. There I go again, saying it out loud. Let the hate mail commence. I'm Steve Gerber. I'll be right back. Keeping you in touch with Michigan and the world. It's Tuesday here on the Steve Gerber Show. Welcome back to it. I had a tumor when I was 17. I don't tell a lot of people that. I know people that have gone through cancer and, and other challenges, and it's always um, it's always enlightening to me to um, see breakthroughs in this um, this battle. Everybody knows somebody, and usually more than one, that have had cancer. Fought, won, lost, all of it. Dr. Jacqueline Jerus is here, Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center, to talk about a cancer decoy that could attract, capture, and possibly destroy malignant cells. Doctor, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. I'm actually also here with the study senior author, Lonnie Shea. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry I knew that. I put that on a different page. Lonnie, welcome to the program as well. Thank you for having us. You're... Um, both here because of this uh, decoy, and, and, and Lonnie or Dr. Which whoever would like to start here, tell me about what, what, what this decoy is and how it functions. Well, it's basically was a, a relatively simple concept, and the idea is that when um, people have metastatic disease, that the cells often go to a specific place, you know, lung, liver, something like that. And uh, just a few years ago, we had this idea of could we make an implant that will look like the lung or the liver, so the cancer cells would go there first. And that way, if the cells go there first, you can imagine having a detection system just that you could kind of create the canary in the coal mine. You could actually see the cancer cells. Um, you know where to scan. You could see them. And then you would actually start, could actually begin therapy early when you only have a few cancer cells. And it just works simply by the immune system, that the immune cells that are uh, present in the body are attracted to the implant. And in cancer, the immune system is a little bit uh, dysregulated. And so you sort of, uh, in the situation of setting of cancer, you get this abnormal um, cells arriving at the implant, and they attract the cancer cells. So, so in like, a way... This is largely how we think the, the mechanism is working. Uh, we're still doing a lot more in the lab now to try to tease out uh, the, the exact details of how this happens. But you can imagine how I feel as a clinician when, you know, patients come in and they have a cough and, as it turns out, it denies a significant uh, amount of distant spread of disease. And so the expectation is that if we can use this device, to earlier diagnose patients when their cancer either returns in a distant location and at the earliest time point that we can further utilize the treatments that have come along in the last uh, several years that have shown great promise for the treatment of cancer in a more effective way. And so I think it's really saying can we, can we take a picture of the patient on a certain level at the earliest time point when they might start uh, uh, you know, they may be getting into trouble at that very earliest time point. 
So in a way, I suppose, you're you're pulling cancer cells out of the dark, you know, um, taking the mystery out of it, because you may sit there for weeks or months or a year, I suppose, seeing if a patient might go into relapse. But this particular case, like you said, the canary in the coal mine, uh, an early warning system for cancer, which is which is interesting. And from that point, the next logical step, guys, would be to find a way to destroy the bad cells uh, that you have attracted, right? That's, that's exactly what we have, and I really think that your perception of how this is working, taking this, this sort of situation, this early metastatic event out of the dark is a great sense of, of frustration for us because the conventional imaging that we have, CAT scanning and bone scanning and such, is incredibly helpful, but it, it tips us off at a time when often we're just, you know, just a... Just moments too, too, too far beyond what we can actually do to, to theoretically cure the patients. And while much of what we're discussing here is remains theoretical and I, the pressure is really on us now to begin to institute clinical trials and we're feeling that from patients all over the world uh, this week particularly, um, I think we perceive with the findings we've had uh, that, that this does hold great promise to potentially have a break, have a bit of a breakthrough in this earliest Step, uh, and bringing these patients into the light. Tuesday on the Steve Gruber Show, we're on the line with Dr. Jacqueline Jerus and Professor Lonnie Shea, who have put together this uh, uh, program. I guess the thing looks like a, a little sponge in a way. It's a super attractor. It attracts cancer cells, pulls them out of the dark so that you don't have to sit and wonder. Because let's, let's be honest, one of the worst things about being sick is not knowing. You know, if you're in remission or think you're in remission, there's always that nagging thought in the back of your mind. What's going on? Could I still be at risk? Could it return? And here is an early warning system that can give people, you know, and maybe not peace of mind exactly, but a fighting chance because you know that, okay, it's returned or it has not. And, and, and come on, guys, this is this is big. <laughs> well, well, you know, we, we greatly appreciate your really incisive understanding of this and we feel incredibly enthusiastic about it, too, but it's so important for us to take the science as the final word on all of this, and I think it's why we really hope that we can uh, get this clinical trial out and start enrolling patients at, the, at, at our soon as possible um, appropriate time point so that we can, we can validate all of this. So what is our next step here? Where do we go from here? Um, uh, obviously, you know, with every success, like you said, there's more pressure. Um, because yeah. now everybody's watching. You know, you, you become a big deal, doctor, and people are all watching. You know, and then that's kind of the way it is. You're in the spotlight. <laughs> but I'd say that I, I think that there being three aspects to the next steps. And so as uh, Dr. Jarris has mentioned, one of them is looking to get a clinical trial ongoing with the data that we have. Um, you know, essentially raise, getting the support for the study, getting approval from the FDA, and um, some of these things have already begun. And I think there are um, two other um, aspects to it. So one of them is we've shown this with breast cancer, and will this apply to other types of cancer? And you know, we have some very early data to suggest that it's possible but we're um, wanting to follow up and pursue that for just a range of cancers. And then the third aspect of it in terms of what's next is that this is a, has been a really unique tool to understand metastasis that um, we've never really had. And so I think one of the reasons that um, sort of these early interventions we're talking about haven't been done before is because the technology to really detect the earliest events in metastasis haven't, hasn't been available. And so we basically have a tool that we can say, how, how are cells getting here? And what are the mechanisms? And if we understand how it's happening, can we change it? Could we um, develop a drug so that cancer cells can't actually colonize an organ? Because now we understand how they actually colonize an organ. And yeah, so I we're wonder beginning if you could, to um... take a more basic mechanistic approach to it as well. My question is, could you... Uh, develop a um, a warning system for healthy folks. You know, here's so, your you know put put your deal in there. And we've only got about uh, 20 seconds here, doctor. But is it possible that we could have some sort of a warning system for people that are have not been sick? Yeah, about 10 seconds. 
Yeah, I think that that's exactly what we also expect may be possible with patients who are at great risk, either have a genetic predilection for cancer, perhaps we could put this into them at a time before they're willing to take more draconian actions to reduce risk, and we could scan this and help them to better understand uh, where they where they sit in terms of their disease events. Doctor, Professor, thank you very much. The Steve Gruber Show, American Values, with Midwestern Common Sense. All right, welcome back to it. It's the Steve Gruber Show on a Tuesday. You know, I just love it when... Uh, the liberals lay the question out there, and they don't get the answer they're looking for. Uh, let me give you an example. If you missed it, and you probably did because the, the uh, viewership wasn't much. Uh, but uh, on the Miss America pageant, right, Miss South Carolina, a black woman from South Carolina, just to be clear, Deja Dial, was asked if she would support an assault weapons ban when it's her turn to answer questions during the September 13th Miss America pageant, and she said, no, I wouldn't. Uh, she, yeah, here's the question. America loves our Second Amendment, but gun violence continues to be a tragic problem. Do you support a ban on military-style assault weapons? Her response was, I don't support such a ban. We need to increase education. We have to go back there. If we teach people the proper way to use guns, then we will reduce the risk of having gun-related accidents. It all starts with education. Immediately thereafter, the Miss America organization used a Facebook post to make sure that everyone knew that Miss Carolina opposed an assault weapons ban, and, you know, the, the hate began. Dr. John Lodd with me this morning, the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. And, doctor, it just uh, you, you're not allowed to speak up when asked by a liberal, and that's the way the rules are. Uh, no, good morning. No, I mean, at this point, I mean, there's some people who are speculating that she didn't do well past that point. Uh, because of her answer. Uh, I mean, I, I would have given a little bit different answer. Uh, the point with regard to the so-called assault weapons wasn't accidents. It was, you know, it uh, was the fact that you have these mass shootings and stuff that she was talking about. And I would have talked about gun-free zones and uh, emphasized that point. But... Um, you know, compared to the quality of the other answers that were being given to these questions, uh, I thought she did fine. Uh, and the problem seemed to be that she just didn't immediately bow and, uh, you know, support uh, the type of uh, liberal legislation that the, that the questioner, that one of the judges in the uh, Miss America Pageant wanted to have. And so, you know, it's... Um, I mean, it's disappointing that... Uh, well, my, my point is this. I think you're onto it there. I think here's the thing. They lay that question out there. They have. They think they know what the response is going to be. I mean, right. this, is, this is the way this works. They're, they're looking for a very specific answer, and so they, they lay out what they think is going to be a softball question. Oh, that's right. I think violence is terrible. We should eliminate all guns, blow something stupid, right? Right. Uh, that's what they were fishing for, if you will. <laughs> and that's not what. And I love it sure. when they don't get no, what they no, I what they think. It was great, you know that uh, she uh, she didn't, you know, just cave in because I'm sure she knew uh, what was being asked of her and what she was supposed to do. But she stuck to her gun, so to speak, and uh, and uh, you know gave the answer that she felt was right, as opposed to what would have been the answer that would have helped her out in terms of winning the contest there. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that she would get punished for, for doing that. But, you know, at least she had the gumption to, to do that. At least she's honest. I mean, at least she's not, you know, she's better than most of our politicians, at least, right? Who, right. who you know, are well, afraid I mean, of answering uh, questions directly. Sure. Uh, you know, I'll give you, you, since you mentioned politicians, I'll give you one example. One person I've been impressed with, uh, though there are many that have good views on guns, but Carly Fiorina, when she ran for the U.S. Senate from California, uh, she made very strong statements on, uh, uh, on gun ownership and the benefits that people have from it in California, of all places. 
So, I mean, when somebody goes and uh, uh, sticks to their guns in a place where they know it's going to make it difficult for them to win, uh, you have more respect for them. And the, and you believe that they must really believe those types of statements or they wouldn't, uh, you know, that would be surely one place where they wouldn't bring it up. What do you think about Carly Fiorina, think of that, and, and the other candidates while we're at it? You know, we're coming up to our next big debate with the Republicans here in a day or two. Uh, Carly's been on here on the program a couple of times. I've not discussed guns with her at length, uh, or at all for that matter. What do you make of the candidates overall? I think there's there's basically two ways that I look at them. One is kind of what they're saying they believe right now, but the other one is how they explain it. And... Um, Compared to past elections, uh, I think we have a better crop of people in terms of they just don't say Second Amendment all the time. You have, you have uh, Ted Cruz, you have uh, Mark Rubio, uh, you have uh, um, uh, Rand Paul, you have Carly Fiorina, who I think, you know, typically most people, when they're asked, most politicians, they just say Second Amendment and that's it. And but these candidates, you actually, if you ask them about different types of gun control measures, uh, uh, they they provide an intellectual argument for why it's important to be able to let people go and defend themselves. Uh, Mark Rubio, for example, uh, Marco Rubio, when he uh, gave his talk to the NRA convention earlier this year, um, uh, he was talking about terrorism and how important private gun ownership was uh, in order to try to prevent that you have so many possible targets that there's no way that uh, police or soldiers can protect everything there. And he gave a strong defense about why it's necessary to have permanent concealed handguns and to encourage it uh, simply to because there's no way you can possibly protect all the other targets that are there. You know, it was great to hear somebody uh, go through and provide that type of large argument. I know Ted Cruz. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've seen him make those similar types of arguments many times. Um, you know, Ben Carson, I, I haven't had a chance to hear him make these types of arguments, but I've talked to his staff, and I know they're very open to that. So um, it's, a, it's a different set of candidates that we have there rather than just saying Second Amendment and thinking people will be satisfied with that answer. Dr. John Lott, always a pleasure.